Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. As you know, these videos are intended to provide a foundational understanding of some of the fundamental principles in microbiology. By no means are they extensive um, overviews with all the gory details. They are intended to provide you the foundation so that later on as we add more details, they will all make sense. Again, if we try to do it all at once, it becomes just too much information and you're like, you know, it's like memorizing the encyclopedia. So my approach is to provide a foundational principle and then later on as you read the textbook and go through more courses, you can add more information. Since this, is, this microbiology class is intended for health science majors, then the prerequisites for this course are far different than they are if you were a biology major. You do not have to have a whole lot of biology or chemistry. As a matter of fact, the, the, the wise guys in government are trying to cut even more prerequisites, so we're having to teach this class without students having even some of the other fundamental concepts that they need to understand it, and today's lecture is an example of that. So I'm going to tr try to provide a broad overview of the topic that we're going to discuss. There's a lot more detail out there. Your instructor may require you to mo know more or know these topics in more detail. Learn it the way that your instructor wants you to do so. Um, I'm going to do it just to provide a little bit of a fund foundational principle for some basic understanding. Now, <clears throat> we've been talking about genetics uh, in the previous videos. We've been talking about the structure of DNA, DNA replication, protein synthesis, meaning transcription and translation, all called gene expression, expressing the genes as a protein product, and the proteins perform the functions of the cell, enzymes and structural proteins and intracellular membrane proteins and things. Now, um, we've even gone a little bit into um, uh, some detail about how we control gene expression using operons. There's uh, induced, uh, inducer operons, repressor operons, and we've discussed that. What we're gonna look at in this lecture is uh, a very, very, very brief touch on one of my all-time favorite topics in biology, which is genetic engineering and recombinant DNA technology. Um, now, to understand this concept, you really, really, really need a whole lot of freshman biology. You need some more chemistry. You need some biochemistry. You need an understanding of genetics. And none of those courses are required as a prerequisite to this class. So I'm going to scratch the surface in a very simple way. Um, but hopefully it helps those of you who are, are health science majors at least have some understanding when you come across this stuff at the next level and in research and literature you understand what they're talking about. That's the goal, okay? So now, when we talk about recombinant DNA technology, to combine something means you put two things together. To recombine means you break something up and put it back together. And that's what recombinant DNA technology is. We're gonna cut apart pieces of DNA and put them back together. And how we do so is all based on some natural processes that have been elucidated or discovered since, you know, the, around the 1970s and on, which has completely revolutionized uh, our understanding of genetics and how we can manipulate DNA and purposely produce certain protein products or make cells do something that they weren't previously doing with a desired outcome. So we are engineering cells and engineering the DNA in cells so that we can force cells to produce a protein product that we desire. We call that genetic engineering. And so, um, just like when you engineer something, you design it, we are designing sort of which genes we want an organism to express. In order to understand this, you really have to understand all the DNA videos that we've talked about before to some degree. Um, and so we're gonna go on about this topic in this fashion, okay? Um, I wanna discuss these things first. So. Um, genetic engineering, when we, when we define genetic engineering, we talk about the purposeful manipulation of DNA to give us a desired um, product or outcome, okay? Um, and, and really, what we want to do is we want to alter the characteristics of an organism. So it is literally the purposeful manipulation of the DNA or the genetic material of an organism to give a desired product or outcome. Okay. That's all that genetic engineering is. Um, in order to understand it, we also need to know a little bit about recombinant DNA technology. And that simply is um, using the resources and the technology to recombine or mix the DNA of two or more organisms. So in recombinant DNA technology, we can literally cut the gene out of one organism 
and insert it into the genome of another organism, and now this, new, this second organism can express the protein products that were encoded in that gene. Um, and you know, all of it again falls under the umbrella of genetic engineering or recombinant DNA technology. Now, in order to understand that, one of the things that we need to understand is some, some basic uh, principles in bacteriology and the study of bacteria. And one of the things that we know is that bacteria can transfer genetic information. Now before I get into that, there's two ways that we can transfer genetic information. When we talk about genetic information being transferred, we're talking about either DNA or RNA, but usually it's DNA in most organisms, unless we're talking about some viruses. There's vertical um, transformation. And the way that we do that is you go from a parent cell and it will tr transfer its genetic information and, or not, it's not transformation, it's transfer, vertical transfer of genetic information. My bad. I was thinking of another term we're about to come to. The vertical transfer of genetic information or of DNA. We go from a parent cell to the offspring. So this would be generation one. And then of course if that cell divides then every generation after that we should have that genetic information from parent to offspring, from parent to offspring. That's what we call a vertical transfer of genetic information. Okay, And everybody kind of understands that. That's our basic concept. But what's new to us for this class is going to be what we call the horizontal transfer of DNA or genetic information. I have two cells that exist. Each one has its own genome. And for example, in bacteria, we can have a little piece of information called a plasmid, a small extra chromosomal piece of DNA. And somehow, some way, in some instances, we're going to get DNA to go from this cell into a cell that already exists. It is not another generation, it's not the, ex, the uh, offspring, but transfer it from, from one cell to another that already exists. We call that horizontal transfer. Horizontal transfer can occur in several ways, okay? So one of the ways that a horizontal transfer can occur is in what we call transformation. Now this happens in bacteria. So sometimes it's called bacterial transformation. And essentially what happens here sometimes is that one bacterium can literally just dump a little piece of DNA into the extracellular fluid, a second bacterium can take that DNA up. It does not require pili and the direct cell to cell transfer, but one cell can just dump some DNA into the extracellular environment, how and why we're not gonna get into the details, and the other cell can take it up and incorporate it into its genome. Um, and, and part of the how and why we'll discuss shortly. <clears throat> now, in what we call conjugation, this is a, a, a topic that we touched on briefly. In conjugation, you have a particular bacterium that might have a plasmid, and if this is, for example, an F positive bacteria, the F positive means it has the plasmid for fertility or the fertility plasmid. And I have another bacterium that is F negative. It does not have this plasmid, and it doesn't have the pili. Well, if these two bacteria come together, then the F positive bacteria can actually copy its plasmid and then insert a copy of the plasmid into the new cell. And as they separate out, now I have two F positive bacteria. So anytime that they come together, we call that conjugation. So, um, Again, it uses the, the fertility pili, or the sex pilus, to transfer bacteria, the plasmids, from one cell to another, okay? And then the third part, the third method that we are we're gonna discuss is called transduction. And in bacterial transduction, this is where um, they use a virus to carry information
from one cell to another. Okay. We call this process um, bacterial transduction or just simply transduction. And viruses, you know, in order to understand transduction, we're going to have to understand a little bit about viruses, but viruses are not cells. Okay. So these three definitions you need to know, we're about to explain this one in a little bit more detail. Okay. And we're going to focus a little bit more on these because understanding how transduction can occur will allow us to understand how gen genetic engineering can occur. It allows us to understand some of the tools used. So, a little bit about viruses, okay? One thing that we know about viruses is that they are not alive. They are not cells. They have no organelles. Not even non membranous organelles. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have any organelles. They don't even have ribosomes. Okay? So they can't even make their own protein products. They have no cytosol. None. They don't have all the machinery that a cell has. Even prokaryotes have some organelles. They're not membranous organelles, but they do have ribosomes. And they have a single circular chromosome and a nucleoid region where eukaryotic cells like us and plants and yeast um, at least have, and fungi, have um, membranous organelles, have ribosomes, have a nucleus with many linear chromosomes in it. Well, viruses don't have any of that. They are a protein coat, usually referred to as a capsid, plus a genome. And that genome can be DNA or RNA. Some viruses use RNA as their genome. So if I were to look at one of these, essentially what happens is a virus can make a whole bunch of the small proteins that all assemble together in a three-dimensional array. And some viruses have very unique protein structures. For example, the coronavirus, which is one we're all getting familiar with, looks like a crown of proteins, and it would be three-dimensional. Imagine this in three dimensions. We have all these little proteins stuck together. It's like a little ball of proteins all stuck together, and then inside of it is the genome. So it's essentially DNA and protein or RNA and protein. That's it. No lipids, no carbohydrates, no organelles, no nothing. And um, one of the coolest looking bacteria that, that you can see is, is called a, a T4 phage or a bacteriophage, the T phages. And their protein coat looks, I mean, they really look kind of alien like. Their protein coat looks like this. They have these little hair like strands sticking off. And then they have these little spike proteins, okay? And they have a genome inside of them. And what they can do is they can attach to bacterial cells. So let's say I have some bacterium here that has its chromosome. They can literally attach to bacterial cells and inject their DNA into the bacterium. Now, bacterial cells, there's a whole group of viruses, by the way, called bacteriophage, and I want you to know this term. Bacteriophage are viruses, oops, can't even write as I get closer to the bottom of the board, viruses that infect bacteria only. They do not affect, infect eukaryotic cells. So bacteria have their own viruses that can cause uh, uh, impact on them, so very often killing the cells. And one of the things that happens is that the bacteria have enzymes that can cut up the phage DNA. Bacteriophage are often referred to only as phage. So if you hear me use the term 
phage, I mean a type of bacteriophage. So bacteriophage can attach to bacteria and inject their DNA. And essentially what happens is, as they do that, there are enzymes that can cut up the, back, the viral DNA, and that protects the bacterium from those um, phage. And in order to protect itself, bacteria have the ability to add what's called a methyl group to some of the cytosines. And a methyl group is simply nothing more than a CH3. As you know, carbon can have up to four bonds. There's three. And then I can stick this to a cytosine, and I have a methylated cytosine. And so, you know, all over the bacterial DNA, they can methylate their cytosines, and it protects their own DNA from those enzymes. Those enzymes can't access their own DNA and cut it up quite as easily. But, on occasion, what can happen is, we can actually cut open a section of the bacterial DNA and insert the viral DNA into the bacterial DNA. So as the bacterium is transcribing and translating genes, expressing its own genes, it can now express the viral genes as well and make viral proteins. Now what happens is, there's a, it's, it's, far, it's, it's an extremely complex process, but essentially what happens is um, some of the initial proteins to be transcribed in this process have the ability to stop the bacterium from doing normal bacterial cell stuff. It just shuts down the machinery of the bacterial cell from doing any bacterial activity. And what it will do is it will start to replicate only the viral DNA. And as it does that, it's going to produce lots of pieces of viral DNA, tons of it. And then it will direct the cell to actually transcribe and translate viral proteins. And it will start making all these little viral proteins. And then those get assembled into new viral particles. When we put the, the protein coat or capsid together with the viral genome, then I can actually make thousands of copies and I'm just going to draw these as little circles and lines. Well, I'll do them like this, okay? Because I don't want to try to draw the, the T phage as they really appear. But every one of these would be one of these, and they would all have the viral genome that's been replicated. And in many instances, they will then lyse the bacterial cell, and as they break the bacterial cell open, it releases these phage, bacteriophage, to infect even more bacteria. And then the process replicates and replicates and they grow in number and infect more cells and more cells. A similar thing happens in our cells, uh, in eukaryotic cells, when a virus invades, it can insert its genome and then use its genome to disrupt the cell's activity, hijack the cell's um, genetic machinery, make tons of copies of the viral genome, as well as produce tons of copies of the viral protein coat or capsid, assemble them, and then lyse the cell and release them. That will infect more cells and more cells and more cells, and you can see how rapidly the number of viral particles. If one virus can result in millions of viral particles being made in a, in a host cell, when that cell lyses, then now up to possibly a million or more new cells can be all infected. And from each one of them, we would multiply it another million times and another million times. And in a short period of time, you can see how a whole population of cells could get overwhelmed. Okay? So essentially what we know is that bacteria, I'm sorry, that viruses are not alive. They are not cells. They don't have any of the cell machinery. All that they are is a protein coat called a capsid with a genome in it. And the genome can be DNA or RNA. There's a special group of, bacteria, of, of viruses called bacteriophage that only affect, infect bacteria. And the way these viruses work is somewhat similar to the viruses that affect, infect eukaryotic cells in that they can inject their DNA, hijack the cellular machinery, incorporate their DNA into this genome, and then cause a massive replication of viral particles and viral DNA, assemble them, kill the cell by rupturing it, and release all those viral particles. Okay. Now, not always does it work that way. Um, in some instances, 
it won't kill the cell, but as this bacteria divides and divides and divides, or as a, as a human cell can exist and divide and divide, or animal cells, eukaryotic cells, they also replicate that viral DNA. In some instances, the, the viral genome and the viral particles lay somewhat dormant for long periods of time, but some stressor can induce lysis of the cell. We see this in things like the herpes virus that exists in the human body for a long time. And then when there's too much stress, like herpes, one of the herpes simplexes is, is, the, is a cold sore. So too much sunlight or too cold of a situation, the temperature extremes can cause the virus to be expressed. We see this in a number of viruses. We're not gonna get into that level of detail, okay? Um, this is one of those topics I have to put the brakes on because I love to talk about this stuff for a long period of time. So essentially what we know is that viruses are capable of um, infecting a cell and then infecting another cell and another cell. In some instances, when we package the viral um, DNA into a capsid, occasionally they might take with them a little bit of bacterial DNA. Um, and in this case, when the viral DNA recombines with a new cell, it can take some of the new bacterial DNA with it and transform or change, alter the genetic makeup of, a, of the other bacterial cell. And we call that um, bacterial transduction, okay? When viral, when viral particles carry some DNA from a host organism to a new cell, it can therefore alter the, the genetic makeup of the new cell. That's all that transduction is, okay? So we know a little bit about viruses, and they're quite interesting, and I wish we had more time to spend on this because it really is a fascinating topic. Now, how does all of this work? How do viral cells do this transduction, okay? Um, and by the way, because viruses require a host cell to replicate themselves and, and perform their functions, they are called obligate parasites. And this is a term that you should know. Um, and obligate means it must, it is obligated to, and parasite means when two organisms live together and one is harmed by the existence of the other. One benefits while the other is hurt by the, the relationship, um, kind of like a lot of human relationships, by the way. You need to ask yourself, am I in a parasitic relationship or am I in a symbiotic relationship where we mutually benefit? Um, a lot of parasites out there. Anyway, an obligate parasite is a cell that must use another cell's machinery in order to um, reproduce itself. So viruses are considered obligate parasites. They re require a host cell's machinery in order to perform their functions, okay? Now, um, when it comes to getting, you know, understanding how we can cut DNA out and put it in or RNA, and we can recombine pieces of DNA, what we need to understand is there's a whole series of enzymes that bacteria utilize in order to chop up some phage DNA. Obviously, some bacteriophage have figured out a way to bypass this, product or this, this process or protect themselves from it. But ultimately, what happens is this. There's a special type of enzyme that's called a restriction enzyme. Restriction enzymes are enzymes that cut DNA at specific sites. And those sites are called restriction sites. Okay? So, a restriction site, and to be restricted, means to be limited, right? So if someone goes on restriction, you get limited to what you can do. Restriction enzymes cut DNA at specific or limited locations. And the restriction enzyme will use what we call a restriction site. And this is a unique, or if we could say specific series of bases recognized, or we could say and cut, by a restriction enzyme. So 
So as you guys and gals know, um, DNA and RNA, uh, specifically we're gonna look at uh, DNA enzymes that are DNA restriction enzymes. It's a series of bases, and the bases in DNA are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, A, T, G, and C. And based on their molecular structure, we know that adenine and thymine can bind together, and guanine and cytosine can bind together. A binds to T, and vice versa. G binds to C, and vice versa, okay? So, if I were looking at a series of bases on a DNA strand, and I get to a series of bases that is G, A, A, T, T, C, and then more bases, more A's, T's, G's, and C's, okay? Well, on the second DNA strand, if we use the complementary base pairing rule, it turns out that on this strand, I would have C, T, T, A, A, G. And if you look at it, G, A, A, T, T, C, if I read this way, G, A, A, T, T, C, they are the exact opposite. They, they're the exact, they read the same forward and backward on either strand. And we call this a palindrome. As a matter of fact, my first name happens to be a palindrome. A palindrome is anything that reads the same forward and backwards. For example, the name Bob is a palindrome. B-O-B -B one way, B-O-B -B the other. Or the name Hannah is a palindrome because it's H-A-N-N-A-H -N -N -A or H-A-N-N-A-H, -N -N -A okay? So palindromes are simply a series of letters or in the case of DNA, since we're talking about biology, a palindrome is a series of bases on two DNA strands that read the exact same in opposite directions. And remember, one strand can be five prime to three prime, the other strand is five prime to three prime in the opposite directions. We call this anti-parallel because they're reading in opposite directions. And remember, DNA is a double helix, and one strand is read from the five prime OH group on the sugar phosphate backbone to the three prime OH group, and this one will be connected from five prime to three prime. We've talked about this in a previous video. Now, there's a restriction enzyme, and it happens to be called, this is called the ECO-R1 site, okay? It's a Roman numeral one. And ECO-R1 comes from E. coli restriction site one. There's several restriction sites in the E. coli genome, but there's a particular one that reads this way, and what happens is the ECO-R1 enzyme, the restriction enzyme that recognizes this restriction site, will recognize it as it zooms along and go, aha, I will cut here. Now I'm gonna erase some of this information up here because we have the definitions, so to speak. And remember, these aren't always technical definitions. These are what I call Mr. Long definitions. They're my simplified way of thinking about it. You can add the technical language. But if I were to cut at the ECO-R1 site on this organism, on this, particular piece of DNA, then as I cut, what I'm going to get is on my one strand, I'm going to get a G left over, and on the second strand, I'm going to have my, and I'm not going to draw always all these chemical bonds, but I would have the, um, oops, sorry, that would be a C. I would have TTAA. -A. Then over here, if I separate this, if I cut here and pull these two strands apart, over here, I would have A-A-T-T-C, right? And on this strand, I would have just a G sticking. And so the ECO-R1 site recognizes this series of bases. The restriction enzyme recognizes this restriction site, cuts the DNA molecule, and we can separate it. It literally goes in and it breaks the chemical bonds between these. It leaves this chemical bond and this one, and we can separate the two strands. They're hydrogen bonds. Now, here's the cool thing. Let's say I have another piece of DNA somewhere in the universe that also has the same restriction site. Well, if I cut this molecule here, and I just remove this piece, I'm going to get this. A 
I'll have these two ends sticking off, right? Now imagine if I had this at two different locations. Now down here, I have uh, uh, CTTAA. So now I have two ends here because I had restriction sites at two locations. Let me erase this, I don't want to confuse you. So this was actually joined to another piece of DNA. And I have the same eco R1 site, the same restriction site, that's gonna be recognized by the same restriction enzyme, but now it's at two places. I have a double-stranded DNA molecule here and here. If I could cut this site on these two, now look, I could take this piece of DNA and it would sit in here like this. There would be a C here, actually. And I would have this. There would be a G here and a G there. So, so when I get these two pieces of DNA sticking out, they refer to these, by the way, as sticky ends. When a restriction enzyme allows some extra bases hanging over that can when I take the overhang of two pieces and stick them together, they call them sticky ends because they simply form their hydrogen bonds. And now I have used a restriction enzyme and a restriction site to cut two pieces of DNA and recombine them. And if this is a particular gene of interest, if the middle section in here has a gene in it, then I can literally cut the gene out of an organism from its chromosome, cut another organism's chromosome open, and insert, and then there's enzymes that will stick it all back together. So I have done what we call genetic recombination. I've recombined the genes of two different organisms. One of the things that we use in our freshman biology lab is we use what's called the PGLO gene. The PGLO gene is a gene that is found in... Um, uh, jellyfish that allow some of the jellyfish deep in the ocean to glow in the dark. And we literally cut the, use the restriction enzymes and if our students do the experiment right and treat it under the right temperatures and just the right conditions and follow the protocol, we can literally take the gene out of the jellyfish. We take some E. coli bacteria, use the same restriction enzyme, apply it. There's some manipulation that has to go on that we don't that we don't have the time to discuss here, but then we can make the bacterial cells take up this gene, reinsert it into their DNA, and if the students do it correctly, then their bacteria, after we let them incubate for a while, will literally glow in the dark. We put them under a UV light and you can see them glowing bright, excuse me, bright green. So it's not super difficult to do. We can actually do this in freshman biology labs and in genetic labs when we're teaching students. And then of course the technology and the knowledge is far greater than this. There are multiple types of restriction sites. Almost all of them when we get sticky ends are palindromes. This is the Eco R1 site. I always refer to it as the GATC site so I can memorize it. There's another one that's called Hind3 from Haemophilus Influenza D site 3. And it uses, I think, A-A-G-C-T-T. -T. And then there's another one, BAMH1, from, um, I forget the organism. Uh, anyway, there's another one. So there's multiple restriction sites and multiple restriction enzymes. Ultimately, what we know is, if I use a restriction enzyme to cut one piece of DNA from one organism, and I have the same restriction sites and multiple locations of another organism, then I can cut a chunk of DNA out of this one, and because I use the same restriction enzyme for the same restriction site, I'll have the same sticky ends, and you can see how they beautifully match up, okay? So we can use this knowledge of restriction enzymes. Some people refer to them as molecular scissors, but we can use our knowledge of restriction enzymes to cut DNA and recombine it and put it back together. Um, by the way, before I get too far, there's a, another type of restriction site that does not give us these sticky ends. Um, and this one comes from, uh, I think it's Haemophilus aegyptia. It's HAE1, uh, or HAE2, 
HAE3, I think it is. Uh, Haemophilus egyptia is a type of bacterium that recognizes this site. It'll recognize any time that there's two G's and two C's in opposite directions, so it's a palindrome, it will literally cut right here and separate the strands. And when we cut them, what we get is this on one strand and the exact opposite on the other strand. And they call those blunt ends because there's no overhang. And so if I have something else, I can literally just insert another piece of DNA in between these blunt ends. If as long as it has a CC and a GG here and a GG and a CC here, there's a recognition. But anyway, so we, there are, my point of telling you this is there are multiple restriction sites and multiple restriction enzymes that can cut the DNA of different bacteria and allow things to be inserted. This is literally how they take a plasmid and insert the plasmid into the chromosomal DNA so that when they need the genes in a plasmid, as you guys know, bacteria have their chromosome and then they have plasmid DNA. If some conditions exist where I need these genes, I can literally use a restriction enzyme and cut it, cut this open and match the ends and then use those genes for transcription and translation and even replication. And when I'm done doing whatever it is that I need to do, I can cut those restriction sites, kick this back out, stick it back together and repair the chromosome. So this is how plasmids are also inserted and removed from chromosomal DNA in bacteria. And those restriction enzymes can often cut up viral DNA and chop it up to protect the bacterium from the bacterial phage. But it turns out that on occasion, because of the sticky ends and the way things match up, turns out some bacterial DNA, I'm sorry, some viral DNA can also be incorporated into the bacteria. And when the virus makes its restriction enzymes to cut its genome out, sometimes it takes some of the bacterial DNA with it, and we call that transformation, okay? So, listen, this isn't the greatest explanation of recombinant DNA technology, but I want you to just be aware that there, there are natural enzymes in cells that can cut DNA and if they cut DNA at a specific location, and we know the series of bases, we call that a restriction site, and the enzyme that cuts at that specific series of bases is called the restriction enzyme. And if that restriction enzyme recognizes the restriction site in one part of the DNA, it will cut anywhere where that enzyme sees that same series of bases. So for eco R1, if I have a piece of DNA that has this, and there's a big chunk of DNA, and then I have another one of these sites. Then eco R1 will cut here and here. We can remove the DNA and stick the sticky ends together. Or I can cut them, separate them, and insert the other piece of DNA. So anytime there's the restriction site, and it can occur multiple times in an organism's genome, the restriction enzyme will cut there. Well, genetic engineering and recombinant DNA technology takes advantage of our knowledge of these enzymes and these locations. And we can chop up DNA and look at it. We can also cut up DNA and create DNA gels. And the larger the molecule, the further it will, uh, the, the less it will fit between the pieces of the gel. And the smaller pieces will travel inside the gel and move further. And we can do DNA fingerprinting. And we can look at uh, sort of a well, you've seen the, the, the bands of DNA when someone does DNA fingerprinting, like when they're solving a murder case. Um, we don't just do it for that case and for that instance. We can look at pieces of DNA from organisms. We can examine the base sequence of organisms and find these restriction sites. Um, there's a lot of other technology that we can talk about. One of them is called PCR. I'll just mention this one, and then we're going to move on. Again, you can't... You can't really understand all of this stuff unless you've had some genetics and there's a lot of terminology. I'd have to teach a whole semester long course to get you to understand just some of this stuff. And that's not to insult someone's intelligence. We just don't have the time to do this. But this stands for polymerase. You've heard of polymerase before. DNA polymerase is an enzyme that will make copies of DNA. 
RNA polymerase is an enzyme that will make copies of RNA or use or rewrite DNA in RNA. But in, in this, um, you should know the name of this. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And so essentially what happens is if I have a little piece of DNA here and there's some little pieces sticking out, I can use, uh, I can, these chemical bonds, the hydrogen bonds can be broken. And if we apply the right amount of heat for the right amount of time, I can separate these two DNA strands. And if I know the base sequence here and here, then I can actually create what's called a primer I can take another piece of DNA that exactly matches it, um, and so I have a series of bases here I can stick a primer on, and then I can take the, the enzyme DNA polymerase and as it binds here, it will copy this strand, and it'll do the same thing on this strand and copy it. So now I've gone from one piece of DNA to two. If I repeat the cycle, I heat, I add the correct enzymes under the right conditions, then these two copies will become four. And I heat those four and separate them, they become eight, and 16, and 32, and 64, and 128, 256, it's 512, and 1024, and 2048, and 4096, and 8,192, or 100, I don't know. The math gets fuzzy after a while. But it's called a polymerase chain reaction because like a chain reaction, once I start it, it happens over and over and over again, and it uses DNA polymerase to actually copy a DNA molecule. And in a short period of time, we can make millions and actually billions of copies of a segment of DNA. And while this isn't necessarily recombinant DNA technology, what I could do is take a series of DNA and possibly with some, with some um, and theoretically we could take it if it has a restriction site here, we can make millions of copies and transform millions of bacteria or we can take, um, well, anyway. When we have small amounts of DNA, there's a technology now called touch DNA. They don't need a whole, a whole large sample. You could literally touch something, and from the cells in your skin and the sweat, there are small pieces of DNA left there. And if a criminologist came in and could swab something, a piece of clothing from a client crime scene, or something that you may have touched, and there may not be enough DNA to actually do all the DNA analysis because you use up the DNA when you analyze it. But what, the, what they do first is they send it to a lab and that lab will use PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to make millions and billions of copies and then they can run it through DNA gels and cut it up and look at the genetic profile and match that up to the genetic profile of suspects and see if the DNA matches, looking at base pairs and things. So, um, so we can take advantage of all of our knowledge of these enzymes and our knowledge of DNA and base pairing rules and um, at what temperature can we heat the DNA to make the, the two strands separate and we can utilize it for our own benefit to achieve a specific goal. So we call this genetic engineering, recombinant DNA technology, or simply DNA technology, where we use DNA in ways that we're, we're not even discussing. Um, and there's other things like cDNA libraries, something that I did in some of my graduate work as well. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a up and coming technology called CRISPR. I, I don't have time to go into how it all works and what we could use it for. But you can really see sort of from a very simple presentation of this stuff that we can use our knowledge of, of DNA, its structure, its function, and our knowledge of enzymes and bacteria and viruses to start to play with DNA and mix and match and recombine things. And we can use recombinant DNA technology for a number of things. One is to um, create things like designer plasmids or designer organisms. We can actually put a whole bunch of genes in a plasmid 
and design a plasmid so that we can insert it into a bacterium and that bacterium will make the protein product that we need. So one of the things that we use DNA technology for is mass production of certain compounds that we need. For example, um, one of the hormones that our body uses in order to balance out sugar, to break down sugar, is insulin. So for a person who has type 1 diabetes, they don't have the ability to make insulin. Well, you know, 60, 70 years ago, 50 years ago, they would take pig insulin, since pigs were pretty closely related to humans genetically, and inject pig, DNA, uh, pig insulin to people. The problem is, because it's a foreign type of, of insulin, some people would have a negative reaction to it or wouldn't take it up, and therefore they would die from their diabetes. They, you couldn't treat it. Well, what someone figured out is, what if I have the gene for insulin, and I can stick a promoter on it to make the cell want to make it, and I can get some sticky ends here near the end of the gene. I have a restriction site somewhere on the chromosome. What if I could cut this out and actually put it into a plasmid and insert this into bacteria and then force the bacteria under certain conditions to incorporate the plasmid into its genome and start running off copies of insulin actually transcribing and translating insulin, and therefore we can make you know, gallons and gallons and gallons in a giant vat of insulin. We can purify, isolate and purify the insulin, stick it in a syringe, and now we can save a lot more lives due to treating diabetes by mass producing insulin using genetic engineering and bacteria. Um, we use Recombinant DNA technology and genetic engineering in order to create vaccines. The vaccine for the COVID-19 uh, COVID is an mRNA vaccine. Um, there are other vaccines that have been created using DNA vaccines. Um, and one of the things we do in vaccines, although we're gonna cover this in much greater detail later, is that we can force an organism to produce just a piece of the protein. So what happens is, if I have a capsid, a bunch of different proteins that makes up the outer covering of a particular virus, one of the things that we can do is we can damage the DNA of the virus and just give you the capsid. And when our white blood cells recognize it, they'll make antibodies against that capsid. And as we mass produce the antibodies, it will actually bind up a whole bunch of these viruses and then our other white blood cells can wipe them out. Well, rather than give you the whole virus, which can cause a reaction sometimes, what if we figured out that it's only this particular group of proteins called an epitope? What if I could produce these proteins and then inject it into your cells and your cells will make antibodies against that protein? And if that section of proteins are in the capsid of a, of a particular virus, then when the real virus enters you, you already have the antibodies against it and you can bind it up and prevent it from taking hold and taking effect or infecting you prior to um, the virus being able to reproduce itself and cause a massive infection. So we can use recombinant DNA technology to genetically engineer organisms for industrial production of mass quantities of certain hormones and things. We can use it for the production of, of specific um, vaccines um, we can also use it to alter the genome of certain organisms like plants or cattle to make them resistant to things like drought or certain bacteria or certain infectious organisms um, or to produce a chemical that may want a worm not to eat a crop so that we can increase crop production, we can increase you know, um, dairy product production. We can do all sorts of things with recombinant DNA technology. Okay, So I hope this provides you some insight into the idea that we can manipulate DNA um, for purposeful uh, means. We can force an organism to take up certain DNA and produce protein products that we are interested in. There's multiple applications for this, but I wanted you to be familiar with the idea that um, a lot of it came from our understanding of bacteria and microbes and viruses and restriction enzymes and bacteria um, and we can use plasmids and we can use viruses as vectors. A vector is anything that will carry the DNA from one organism to the other. Viruses can act as vectors. 
plasmids connect those vectors. And we've talked about bacterial transformation, uh, transduction, and um, conjugation, how bacteria can transfer um, DNA horizontally, okay? So anyway, listen, I could go on for a whole two semesters on this stuff, but you really need a strong understanding of cellular and molecular biology and genetics and a lot of things that are not prerequisites for this particular class. So we'll cut it there. Um, again, the point of all of this is that you understand that we can manipulate DNA, that there are natural tools available to us, and our knowledge of DNA structure, of protein synthesis, of base pair and ordering um, of enzymes allows us to, to purposefully alter the genetic material of an organism and make it produce what we're interested in. Um, oh, and one of the other things I forgot to tell you, um, we use these enzymes to figure out the human genome or to figure out the genome of certain, certain organisms. You've probably heard of the Human Genome Project, but we actually know the entire base sequence of both strands of DNA in e, e. coli and many other bacteria. We know the, the entire genome of many viruses like the T4 phage and the T7 phage and a few others. And as we figure this out, we can figure out what genes they're coding for, what proteins they're coding for, and learn a lot about them. So um, part of the Human Genome Project is using some of this technology like PCR and genetic engineering and recombinant DNA technology and restriction enzymes um, and many other concepts that we're not even gonna go into in order to figure out the genomes of individuals. Um, and it's powerful information and technology that is allowing us to really, um, really alter uh, the course of natural events and, and organisms and force them to do things that we need them to do. Now, finally, this always comes with, there's always an unintended consequence of everything that humans do. Every time we try to fix a problem, our, there's an unintended consequence of making the matters worse. When I was a kid growing up, you got your groceries in a paper grocery bag, the brown paper bags, and people would carry their groceries in that. Well, paper comes from trees, and in order to make all the paper bags for all the grocery stores, we had to kill trees, and that was a bad thing because trees absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and we're gonna kill the whole earth and the whole entire ecosystem, so we must quit using paper bags. So they came up with plastic bags. Most of y'all have seen the plastic bags, don't even know what paper bags are if you're not old enough. Well, now we realize that plastic bags are creating all sorts of problems. Uh, every time man tries to solve a problem, we create unintended consequences that very often might be worse than the problem we're solving. And we see this throughout human history, and that's one of the problems with genetic engineering is there's, there are consequences, so we must treat this stuff ethically and morally and there are people in the world that are taking advantage of it. Who knows how the COVID-19 virus escaped from Wuhan, China, but um, it may have been purposeful, someone may have engineered it, or it may have escaped accidentally, but this is what we're doing in some of the research labs across the world is genetic engineering to try to make life better for mankind, but you just never know when there's an unintended consequence that later on we go, uh-oh, or oops, and we gotta fix that problem which is why some people aren't into GMOs, genetically modified organisms. But genetically modified organisms have been used throughout time. Um, we didn't use recombinant DNA technology, but you might breed certain plants to give you a hardier or better, a larger tomato or a bigger ear of corn. You know, the cornichons, the little tiny corn. Well, most corns of, uh, ears of corn were tiny, but through specific breeding of certain species, we've been able to alter organisms. We do it with dogs, we do it with cattle, we do it with horses when you hear something being purebred. Um, but now we're actually doing it at the molecular level genetically, purposely to alter organisms so that we can make plants resistant to things like droughts and um, certain insects that might want to eat them. And um, we get increased crop production to hopefully feed more people and stop starvation throughout the world, increased production of milk or cattle. Um, and uh, and so there's some good, but there's a whole section in the book that you can read on about the ethics and the moral, the morality of genetic engineering. There's, a, there's always a, a bad part that comes with the good part. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling about that, and I don't want to go too far into it because we're not going to test you on that. Um, 
Anyway, I hope that you learned something from this video. I hope that it gave you a little bit of insight in that we have very powerful ways of manipulating DNA and genetic material to get a desired outcome. And we're taking advantage of it on a daily basis to cure diseases, treat diseases, to treat cancer, to come up with vaccines, to make life better for it, for people and animals and plants. Hopefully we can make the world a better place. Hopefully we won't mess it up with some unintended consequences. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I'll see you in the next video.